Section 11 of The Mystery of the Ocean Star. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. J. Frank. The Mystery of the Ocean Star by W. Clark Russell. Section 11. Longshoreman's Yarns. I was sitting on the beach of a south country watering place, with a book on my knee and an umbrella over my head. A longshoreman stood behind. I had glanced at him, and was on the whole well pleased with his appearance. He was the most nautical longshoreman I had ever beheld. He was dressed in a complete suit of pilot cloth, though the thermometer stood at eighty-two degrees in the shade. His hair fell in ringlets down his head, and his black beard was trimmed so as to stand out from under his chin like the tail of a bird. He had very small black eyes, and a face dotted with pock-marks. I had noticed him before, and he had impressed me with the fancy of a mariner who had been cast away on a desert island for a number of years, during which time he had eaten nothing but grass and barnacles, and who, being rescued by a ship, had been made clean and comfortable by the loan of a suit of clothes. I was looking at my book when I heard someone address him. I peeped cautiously under the umbrella, and saw a tall, knock-kneed young man in white flannels and a straw hat, prominent eyes, and an open mouth. The youth asked the longshoreman some question about lifeboats, and then he wanted to know what was the difference between a cutter and a brig, and if the longshoreman had ever saved a human life, and if so, what reward did he get? Questions of this sort were multiplied, and by a peculiar tone in the answers returned by the longshoreman, I gathered that he was quietly taking stock of his open-mouthed young friend. "'Were you ever in danger?' inquired the young gentleman. "'What sort of danger?' responded the other. "'I was once nigh marrying a woman that turned out to have buried four husbands in eighteen year. "'But I didn't know it. Do you mean danger of that kind?' "'Oh, no,' said the other, speaking very gravely. "'I mean the dangers of the sea. I suppose you have been a sailor.' "'You may suppose, sir,' exclaimed the longshoreman with emphasis. "'Why, gore bless my soul, I went to sea when I were two year old, and only knocked off four year ago.' "'Really? At two years? In what capacity?' "'Why, as a infant in the custody of his mother,' said the longshoreman. "'I could pretty well foresee what was coming.' Here was a youth who wanted to be able to go home to tea, and tell his mother and sisters, and perhaps his grandmother, that he had been having a talk with one of the most wonderful old sailors that was ever heard of, a seasoned tar, a hearty salt, a real seaman, much more exciting than the sailors you read about in novels. Longshoremen are on the lookout for weak-kneed, large-eyed young men of this description and to the gentleman with the corkscrew ringlets, the young fellow in flannels was what he himself would call a job. "'Then you have really been in danger at sea?' "'Ay. See that there row of men in fair-knot trousers a-leaning over the rail? Very well. One of em is two and seventy year of age, and ne'er a man amongst em but what's seen perils enough to turn apothecary's hair white.' Now I tell yer what you shall do. You shall tarn to and roll up all them men's experiences in one parcel, and I tell you the least of what I've suffered would drag the whole bilin' of it up if it were moored thirty fathom deep with an anchor that hadn't been lifted eighty year. Really, said the young man. Why, see here, cried the longshoreman, feigning a sudden excitement, as if memory had been somewhat abruptly touched. I'll give you one danger to start with. 
I was in the mizzen rigging of a big ship that was outward bound to the coast of California. It was blowing a fresh breeze of wind dead astarn, but the sky was blue as this here is, ay, just as blue. Well, I can't rightly remember the particular job I was on, but I recollect of going on with it for some time. When casting my eyes astarn, I seed a cloud like a balloon coming up right in the tail of our wake. It drawed nearer and nearer, and the nearer it drawed, of course, the bigger it growed. I seed it, as I told you, but supposing that the mate seed it too, I says nothing, but went on quietly with my work. It warn't until that there cloud had put the sun out that the mate took notice of him, and then I seed him a cockin' of his high aloft. Presently the cloud was drawed right overhead and was a regular downright thunder cloud, coming out the blacker for the sun that shone out all round it. When he'd come right on top of us, as it might be, he seemed to stand still as if taking a survey of the wessel. The mate suddenly sings out, By thunder! Perkins, if the lightning conductor ain't stopped to the foot of the stay! If that there cloud womits a blast, the Lord have mercy on our souls. Extraordinary, said the knock young man. Jump, Perkins, cries the mate, as if your mother-in-law was in chase of ya, and cut the conductor adrift, and let the end tow overboard. I'm the man, sir, as would walk into a lion's den when the animals was voracious with waiting for their raw meat, and sit down and think nothing of it. I'm a cove as a man that their lifeboat, if so be as my arms had the strength for to rower, though ne'er another party along the coast volunteered. But when it came to my having to handle a lightning conductor, with the cloud overhead just quietly waiting for me to touch it to let fly, I hung a moment in the wind. But the true character of the British tar was too strong for me. Hobe hoarders if you break owners, is the old saying. Sailors of my kind always puts duty first and death last. I pulled out my sheath knife, jumped out of the mizzen rigging, and ran across to the main royal backstay down which the conductor was led. I was within two foot of it, when there was sich a blaze that twas like a man putting his head into the sun. Down I fell in a faint. When I comes to, I finds all the steel of my knife melted, and my fingers a-clutching the bone half. And what else do you think had happened? The tall gallantmast and topmast was split, and the whole mess of it had come down. Besides that, there was twenty foot of the rail close to which I was a-standin', smashed sheer overboard. Now, sir, go and ask any of them men leanin' over that there rail if they can match this. "'Pon my honour, it's extraordinary,' said the young man. "'I'll tell you a more amazing thing yet,' continued Perkins. "'I was aboard a ship bound to the north of Chiney. "'There ain't no part of the world that I haven't visited. "'One day I was sent aloft to paint the royal masthead "'from what we calls at sea the highs of the riggin'. We was a passenger ship, and there was ladies on the poop, no awning spread, everything clear to the high. I was an ordinary seaman in them days, nimble as a monkey, and never met any man as could beat me at the hornpipe. As I was painting away, a loft had entered my head, that if I was to get upon the truck and stand upright upon it, the ladies would be pleased with the sight and perhaps take some notice of me for the rest of the voyage. There was a spike fixed top of the truck about the length of your leg, sir. This here spike was intended to carry what they calls a wane to show how the wind blows. 
but there was no wain upon it, and the spike stood up naked. Well, no sooner thought on than done, I whips on to the truck, and clippin' hold of the spike stood up waiting to be took notice of. The ship were rolling and pitching a bit, and the motion, as you may reckon, was pretty strong up atop of the mast. Finding it tidy, tiring work, and none of the ladies a-looking, I was for coming down, when, in some way there's no splainin' of, I wriggled my unmentionables on to the spike, which held me like a butcher's skewer. I tried hard to get adrift, but there was no releasing of myself. I could have cut away with my knife, but there's no cause to explain to a high-minded young gentleman as I see you are the reasons why I didn't. I don't know that ever a mortual mariner was in such a hawful situation afore. It makes me giddy now that I'm an old man even to think of it. The spike wouldn't allow me that give and swing of the leg which I had when I was a holdin' of it, and every instant I expect to slip and find myself hanging by nothing stronger than my trousers at a height of, well, I dare say you might call it a hundred and eighty feet. Awful! exclaimed the young gentleman. Presently, continued the longshoreman, the chief mate catches sight of me and sings out, "'Aloft there! What are you up to a tom foolin on that there truck? Lay down, you hear, or—' And here he cussed and swore horrible. "'Lay down!' exclaimed the young gentleman. "'What could he mean?' "'He meant come down, but lay down is the proper term for come down at sea.' "'I can't lay down, sir,' I bawled. "'I'm hooked, sir. "'There's the spike of the wain gone clean through me, sir.' "'Everybody was now looking up, as you may suppose. "'It was like being in the clouds to me, "'and I couldn't hear a word that was said, "'cepting when I was yelled at. "'The captain was sent for, "'and he arrived with his speaking trumpet "'and shouted, "'Perkins, come down!' I told him I couldn't, and that I'd forfeit all my wages if I was able to come down. Then they took a look at me through a telescope, and afterwards sent the boatswain aloft, who came as high as the royal yard and viewed me. Boatswain, says I, you see how it is, says I. I feel already wonderfully queer and sick, I says, says I. "'And if I'm to be kept a standing up here much longer,' I says, says I, "'without something being done to deliver of me. "'I'm a dead man,' I says, says I. "'Well, Perkins,' he says, says he, "'I'll go below and tell the captain your condition,' he says, says he, "'and we'll have to tarn to and see what's to be done for ye." "'Well, to cut this here yarn short, what do you think they had to do at last? "'Why, strike the mast!' "'Strike the mast!' exclaimed the young gentleman, in a voice that showed his mind hopelessly fogged. "'Aye!' exclaimed Perkins emphatically. "'Strike the mast with me atop of it. "'They had to send the royal and toggallant yards down.' "'Reave the mast rope and lower away "'until they brought me on to a level with the topmast head. "'They had to use the knife, after all, to get me adrift. "'I was an hour on that there truck, "'and if you was a sailor, sir, "'and could understand what it was to stand on the top of a lofty mast, "'on a circular piece of wood about as big as the crown of a straw at, "'with nothing to hold on to and nothing to support you, but a spike through your unmansionables, and then to have to undergo all the jerks and vibrations of being lowered, you'd agree with me that there ain't nothing in sea stories as beats the like of that experience. It is too awful, you know, really, exclaimed the youth. But arter all, 
continued Perkins, after a short silence. "'That there truck job is a mere mosquito bite alongside what happened to me once in a voyage round the world and back again. We was an old-fashioned ship and carried what was called single tossels.' "'Oh, indeed!' exclaimed the young gentleman. "'Aye, single tossels. "'It was in the middle watch. "'I was below, sleeping soundly. "'Nothing could ever stop me from sleeping soundly. "'They say it's a sign of a first-rate seaman. "'I believe it is, myself. "'All on a sudden I was woke up by a terrible thumping, "'and, as usual, was the first on deck.' The ship was on her beam ends and half a gale of wind blowing. Well, we let go and clued up and got her middlin' easy. The watch I was in was told to jump aloft and put two reefs in the foretossel and then furl it. Very well, I was in the bunt and the sail was clued up. It was so black that sleep itself ain't blacker. You couldn't see an inch. And everything had to be done by feelin'. I was leaning over the yard to help haul the slack of the sail up when I overbalanced myself and fell. I fell right forward over the yard, but instead of striking the deck, I was caught in the bite of the canvas that the men was furling, which, by being triced up by the bunt lines and the likes of them ropes hung like a hammock under the yard, I sung out of the top of my voice but to no purpose. The wind was screeching horrible, and the men not being able to see had to yell to each other, and I was a bit muffled up, too, down there, so that in the general confusion my voice wasn't heard. Well, what do you think was the end on it? Hang me, sir, if they didn't stow me in the bunt of that there sail and make as smooth a job of me with their bunt gaskets as if they was going into arbor. All night long the gale blowed, and all night long I laid in the heart of that there tossel. How awfully beastly! exclaimed the young gentleman. I wonder you weren't smothered. Aye, and so I nearly was. Yet I must have made shift to breathe somehow or hover, I suppose. All the blessed while I was a-thinkin', when it comes on fine, they'll set this here sail, and when they lets fall the bunt, what's to become o' me? I couldn't hear nothin', and felt like being wropped up in my hammock ready for the last toss. Suddenly they loosed the sail, and away I rolled down into the bottom of the bite of canvas. I roared out with the fright and the dazzle, for it was broad day, and the sun a-shining, and then, my presence of mind coming to me, I screeched out, For God's sake, keep fast them bunt lines until I gets out of this. All hands had supposed me overboard, and the chaps who had loosed the tossel hearing my voice, but not being able to see me, took me to be Perkins's ghost, and ran down on deck in a terrible funk. If it had depended on them, I might a lain in that there tossel until the end of the voyage. However, some of the other chaps comes aloft, and seeing how it was, they lowers a bowl into me, into which I got, and was hauled up. Extraordinary, said the young gentleman. What awfully horrid dangers a man meets with at sea. Why, even that's nothing, continued Perkins. Compared to one mortal experience I met with in a voyage from California to Chiney, and from Chiney to Chile by way of New South Wales. I falls from aloft, and when picked up was in a dead swoon. They give me two days, then stitched me up in a hammock and brought me to the gangway. For some hours I knowed what they was up to, but couldn't speak. But when I felt myself put on the gratin, and that I couldn't be mistook in supposing the skipper to be close by, with a prayer-book in his hand— 
I says to myself, Perkins, I says, says I, you must make a heffort or it's good night, I says, says I. And I did make a heffort. It felt like bustin' hup. The skipper was in the middle of the orifice when I made that there heffort, and I rolled off the gratin' and fell with a mighty flump on the deck. I was afterwards told the chap as had held the grate and let go, and ran up the rigging. Others of the crew bolted forwards and tarned in. The consternation was wary surprising. However, the captain, calling for his knife, rips open the hammock, and out I steps, none the worse for having been dead, and suffering from nothing more than perspiration. "'By George!' exclaimed the young man. "'How awfully disgusting it would have been, you know, "'if you hadn't been able to move.' "'Aye,' answered Perkins, "'it would. "'But taking sea dangers all round, "'I reckon there's none worse than thirst.' "'Thirst must be fearful,' said the young gentleman. "'It is fearful,' responded Perkins. "'It's fearful, sir.' when you've been in an open boat as I have for three weeks and haven't had so much as a drop of dew to cool your burning lips. But I'll tell you when it's fearfuller still, when thirst is fearfulest of all, sir, and that is when a man's dry as I am now, parched, I may say, without the value of a half a pint in his pocket, and with several first-class publics hard by. No more was said. The young gentleman moved off. Perkins followed him. I stood up to see which way they went, and perceived Perkins with the young gentleman at his heels, making a direct course for the three thirsty sailors. Perkins was not to be my only experience that same day. I was not a little amused and interested in the afternoon, when, on asking an old boatman with whom I had been conversing for some time to refresh himself at my expense, I stepped with him into a little ale-house close down by the sea, where I found myself in the presence of seven or eight watermen, regaling themselves with beer and tobacco. As a rule, when the number of this kind of men get together, they talk in couples, and the confusion is lively, hoarse and salt arguments being incessantly traversed by shouts and yells to Tom or Jim to confirm the accuracy of a remark, or to furnish a name or a date. The boatmen I found myself amongst, however, were conversing and listening with great propriety, one speaking at a time, whilst the others thoughtfully smoked or interjected such remarks as, "'Why, yes, that's true enough,' or, "'There ain't no contradicting that, Tommy,' or, "'Just my views, as Simon here'll tell ya." It was my part to listen. I lighted a pipe and sat down, whilst my boatman, having taken a chair opposite me, and raised his glass with a, "'Well, here's my respects to you, sir,' and swallowed half the contents, turned to another old boatman who was sitting near him, and exclaimed, "'Joe, what was the crowner's findin' consarnin' that there dead body picked up under the cliff t'other day?' "'Why, I hear that it was agreed he'd come by his death through a swound. That's better than saying he was drunk. But these here accidents ain't calculated to do us men much good.' Nothing going on round the coast now but what the papers calls casualties. The public will end in taking fright, and Borton will go out a date altogether. It's pretty nigh gone altogether as it is, said a young boatman. Whatever accidents happen, exclaimed an old man who was addressed by the others as Tom, is chiefly caused by the public theirselves. There's a ignorance and a selfishness amongst holiday people, and others as ought to know better, as makes me astonished, that hundreds and hundreds ain't drowned every summer. 
there was a man here t'other day from a port down west he was telling me that a steamer was chartered by some speculative covey to carry people at so much a head each up a river to view the scenery well this here man thought as he'd go and have a bob's worth of sight-seeing so he steps aboard the steamer where he finds about a hundred and fifty persons already assembled still they was a-comin the bell kept all on a ringin and the people a-runnin till pretty nigh three hundred men women and children was aboard that steamer and then time being long passed up and no more passengers appearin the vessel steamed off well the man as told me this said that from the paddle-box the decks looked full and i dare say they did he thought they was now going straight on up the river stead of which on rounding a corner what should come into view but a pier chock full of people and a crowd behind waiting for room on the pier to shove forward the steamer drove alongside and the man told me he never see such a sight as followed there was drunken soldiers and sailors men women with babies in their arms little children all thrustin shovin shoutin cryin and screechin as they jumped aboard the people in the steamer wanting to see what was happenin all ran to one side of course and listed her down till she was sponsin under then there was what they calls a panic some one sung out that the vessel was going down there was an old barge moored alongside the pier and when the people took fright there was a jump for it my man told me he got in making sure the steamer was foundering he says after that all he recollects plainly of was the people on the pier being shoved by the people astarn of em towards the steamer and the people on the steamer trying to get on to the pier and numbers of them jumping into the barge likewise he recollected the screams of the people seeing women fainting chaps leaning over to pull children up out in the water drunken soldiers and sailors fighting the people in charge of the steamer looking on helpless as if they was drunk too and imbecile until at last he says the people crowded so fast into the barge that they shoved several persons overboard he amongst them he lay hold of a line that moored the barge to a pile or upright on the river's bank and hauled hisself ashore and he says to me that he'd never go sightseeing again in a steamer not if he was to be paid a hundred pounds down for every excursion if said the boatman the public chooses to put itself into such situations as this callin of em pleasure makin who's to save them from being massacred if with eyes in their heads and with looking they can't see a tremendous danger straight in front of them why then they must be drowned yes said another man but drownin's bad for borton it don't want many accidents to make a bad season i don't know exclaimed the boatman whether bylaws restrainin people from going out in borts without a man wouldn't be good for us watermen as diminishing danger and so rendering borting more comfortable and agreeable i've known visitors who might otherwise have been good customers to take fright at merely watchin of a couple of cockneys out in a sailin board only the other day i made up my mind that two young chaps long with two young gals was bound to go they kept the sheet fast and three of em sat to lord trailing of their hands in the water with the chap a steering to windward of the helm sometimes luffing till she was all shaking and sometimes letting her go through it ramping full had the wind freshened instead of failed the bort must a capsized as sartin as that there pewter pot would fall to the ground if i shoved it off this ere table then what would have happened why said another man borton would have been knocked on the head for the rest of the summer ay said a gruff fellow and take the skylarking that goes on in boats i've seen a boat loaded down to her gunwale with a party of men and women and idiots standing up on the thwarts of their legs wide apart swaying of the boat to make her roll 
and all the females screeching with laughter as if by the lord they was rehearsing for another kind of screeching and then take one of them chaps who pretends he knows how to row pullin away with the tide and reckonin that because he sees things passing pretty quick he's made a mistake in not taking to rowing as a profession if he's never heard of again tain't his fault astonishing what a lot of fools there are in this world exclaimed my old boatman i once see a young wench shoving a perambulator along the quayside where it slopes she turns the perambulator towards the water in order to see down upon the deck of a vessel that was hauling in alongside wanting to blow her nose perhaps she lets go the handle to feel for her handkerchief when away goes the perambulator with the babby in it slop into the water since then i've took notice of the number of women as turns their perambulators upon that slope towards the water if they want to look at anything over the quayside ten out of every fifteen does it and if ten out of every fifteen babbies ain't drownded in that place it's because the women forgot to let go the handles to feel for their handkerchers stupidity said an old fellow in a growling voice why there's no hen to it take the case of that gent's son that was a fishing off the pier he was sitting with his legs over the side said he for the information of those who had not heard the story there was other boys and one or two men fishing off that pier likewise this here gent's son gets a bite and sings out that he's caught a fish here in this t'others come running up to see crowd about him whilst he's hauling up a dab about as long as your little finger and in their excitement elber him clean overboard well he wasn't drownded but he came very near to it had he been drownded said the old fellow contemptuously there'd been a scare fishing it a received a knock on the head and one more of the diversions as people comes to the seaside to enjoy would have suffered for the rest of the season and been the cause of folks leaving perhaps afore their time ay exclaimed one of the men and look what happens on account of the fools who walk along the beach when the tides are rising do you remember that chap harry as you and me found lying on the rocks harry and me he continued was a coming along making haste for the tide was rising fast when we see a man lying among the rocks and the water coming up close to him he moved and signed to us to come to him we found he'd sprained his ankle and broke his right arm by tumbling down he'd been groping about among the pools for whatever he might come across he was a middle-aged man pretty tidily dressed it was lucky we sighted him he were as helpless as the rock he lay on and the evening was drawing up as well as the tide he told us he'd been singing out till he lost his voice and that seemed true enough for he could scarcely speak if that chap had ended in becoming a corpse as he were bound to it if we hadn't come across him there'd have been a fresh start for the wisitors dear me they would have said what a place that is for drowning to be sure tain't safe even to think of better try ramsgate or dover next time dunno about ramsgate exclaimed one of the men there's a good many accidents happens that way i believe there's a talk i'm told of putting up a sort of steps or stages there for people to take refuge upon when they're caught by the tide the idea ain't bad but what sort of steps they'll they be i wonder timber they'll have to be pretty solid i reckon if they aren't to be washed away better to cut steps in the cliff i should say with an iron handrail solidly let in and a big hauler with a seat or two high enough out of any water as might dash up i know them cliffs said my old boatman there's not much confidence to be put in steps cut out of chalk chalk crumbles matey why look at the litter that lies all along them sands 
it takes more than a lump of chalk to scare me but i've walked a many times twixt ramsgate and broadstairs and never felt comfortable unless i'd a good hundred foot tween me and the clifts why i was once passing along when i see a block of chalk pretty nigh the size of old tom's cottage come thundering down twere like an earthquake and made you think of the country going to pieces well not fifty yards further on i see a couple of spoonies sitting with their arms round each other's waist a makin love at the bottom of the cliffs with just such another rock as had tumbled down standing out right over them they must have heard the shindy the chalk made when it fell but you think they took any notice not a had em and when i sings out and points to the lump over their heads and to the heaps of stuff all about em the young chap he cries out get along you old fool and mind your own business ay exclaimed a strapping young boatman that's their way a gent once came running up to me out of breath hi he says there's two young fellers he says says he as are rowing theirselves pretty nigh clean out of sight with the tide i don't know em he says but i've been a-watching of them and i'm sartain he says says he that if help ain't sent to em there'll be an accident well i naturally supposed that they'd be glad of some one to help em to get back and i wanted a shilling bad for i hadn't errand a farden that week well i jumps into my boat and pulls away arter em and by and by picks them up they havin got their boat's head round they cheeked me at first said if it came down to a matter o rowing they dared say that they'd had more jobs of that kind than i should have had the audacity to dream of and they talked to me in that fashion however i put up with their imprints being wishful to earn a shilling and arter a bit they let me get into their boat and with my own in tow we started they relieving each other and me tugging away all the time well we got home the two chaps paid the man as the wherry belonged to and was walking off when i followed em and asked them to remember of me seeing as it had been a pretty stiff job why says they we never asked you to come you volunteered what you take us to be the exercise'll do you good you look as if some of that there fat wanted perspiring out of you and with that they walks off laughing at the top of their voices. "'You're speaking,' said a little fellow, who had been looking anxiously for an opportunity to say a word, "'of the covey you found with his arm broke and his foot sprain, "'reminds me of a incident that I confess rather gave me a turn at the time. There was some children with their clothes tucked up and their legs bare paddling about in the water. My boat lay off, and I was trying to get custom. Presently the fattest old woman as ever I see in all my life passed me with her petticoats held up and her feet exposed. I never see such a figure. She'd got a red velvet hat on, and I reckon that if instead of going into the sea— she'd have been coming out of it there'd have been a regular ski daddle well this here fat woman goes into the water just like a ball being blowed along without revolving she steps in till the water comes three or four inches above her ankles when all of a sudden she falls flat down upon her face and there she lay with nothing showing but the round of her back guessing something wrong i dashed in arter her and got her head up out of it but it took four men to carry her on to the sands a doctor come and said it was hapoplexy or something bearing that name it's some time ago now said the man but i tell you mates if i see that there woman's face when i turns in of a night it's a sign there ain't to be much sleep for me and i generally has to see the doctor harry shouted a fellow across one of the tables to a tall melancholy-faced boatman do you remember the case of the skylark as that engineer chap off the tug was telling us about remember said the tall man 
"'Why, yes, of course I remember. "'I don't know,' he continued, addressing the others generally, "'and taking the story out of his mate's mouth, "'as ever I heard of a closer shave. "'You know the something bank,' said he, "'referring to a shoal, the name of which I cannot recall. "'Well, a party of four men and three women "'hired a boat for an hour's sail. "'They wouldn't take a man with them, "'as they said they knowed all about handling a sailing-boat "'and was too old to stand in need of teaching. "'The bank was dry, but the tide was rising. "'The water was middling smooth and a nice breeze a-blowing. "'They said it would be a good lark to sail for that there bank, "'get ashore and play kiss in the ring. "'It'd be something to talk about, they thought, "'playing kiss in the ring on a place where there'd been plenty of shipwrecks. So, said the long boatman, rendering his story impressive by his hoarse utterance and deliberate manner, they heads for this bank, and they fetches it. Well, they downed the lug, letting the boat lie with her stem on the sand, and they all got out, supposing in their ignorance that the boat'd lie all right. They was springing and larking about, kissing and squealing and the likes of that, when presently their boat goes adrift, and as they hadn't let the yard of the sail come well down, there was just a little bit of canvas showing, enough to let the wind help the tide with her nicely. The excursionists on seeing this felt, I dare say, as if it was time to give up kissing, and more reasonable to go to prayers. What their feelings was, mates, you may imagine. For by this time they could see that the bank was growing smaller, which properly led them to suppose that the tide was making fast. Most luckily for them, there was a tug coming along, meaning to give this here bank a wide berth, but keeping a bright lookout, as they generally does aboard them wessels, they sighted the boat all adrift, and on their shifting their helm for her, they drawed close enough to the bank to see figures upon it. So they took the boat in tow and went away for the bank. But by this time the water was over the party's feet, and it didn't need to rise much higher with the tide that was running to wash them all away. There was a scramble to get them, and a job it was, the engineer, he told us. But they was got off at last pretty near in a dying condition and brought ashore. This seemed to end the boatmen's experiences, or at least their conversation upon this particular topic. I rose and quitted the room. End of section 11 Recording by M. J. Frank, Portland, Oregon